Hello and welcome back to Politics and Polls. I'm Julian Zelizer, a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University, and this is my co-host and colleague, Sam. Hi, this is Sam Wong, professor of neuroscience and molecular biology, and also co-founder of the Princeton Election Consortium. Well, every week, Sam seems to bring a new surprise. Uh, two of the biggest stories since we last met have involved uh, the Democratic nominee, Hillary Clinton, she first lit up the internet with a comment that half of Trump's supporters fell into the basket of deplorables and facing criticism she walked back the statement taking back the half part of what she said could be more <laughs> and then during um, the event in 9-11 uh, Clinton had to leave early and cameras caught her falling when she was trying to get into the car uh, campaign announced that she had walking pneumonia and would miss a few days of the campaign where she had been scheduled to go to the West Coast, and this has become an ongoing story uh, every minute of the day, speculating on her health, and and now we've had more discussion about Donald Trump's health uh, and when he's going to talk about what his doctors say. And finally, some of the polls are suggesting that the race is actually tightening in some battleground states. Uh, so today, Sam and I are, are going to turn to one of the biggest issues in this race, and that's the role of gender in American politics. For Hillary Clinton, being the first female nominee of a major political party has obviously uh, led commentators to take a more serious look at the way in which gender impacts the political process, as well as the many comments we have heard from Donald Trump mm -hmm. since the Republican debates. This is not the first time that we've had discussions of this issue. It's been around uh, throughout much of American history. Uh, in the early 1980s, for instance, is when the concept of the gender gap really uh, comes to the forefront after Ronald Reagan's 1980 election performance. Uh, this was a subject of a lot of speculation in the campaign with people like Lee Atwater and uh, Elizabeth Dole. It came up again recently in 2008 when discussing the different media uh, treatment of Hillary Clinton versus Barack Obama, and it's obviously a subject that it's at the heart uh, of our of our politics. And to help us sort through the issue. We have one of the most fascinating voices in journalism uh, on these issues, Rebecca Traster, who writes for New York Magazine and is a contributor to Elle. She's been writing uh, about uh, women in politics uh, for many outlets, the New Republic, Salon, Washington Post, The Nation, and much more. Her first uh, book was Big Girls Don't Cry, which was uh, arguably the most insightful look uh, at women in the 2008 election and the winner of the Ernesta Drinker Ballard Book Award. And her most recent book, which has received a lot of uh, attention and is really fantastic and an important piece of work, is called All the Single Ladies, Unmarried Women and the Rise of an Independent Nation. So welcome to Politics and Polls, Rebecca. Thanks so much for inviting me. Well, let me just, I'll, I'll open it up uh, with a broad question, uh, just to hear your thoughts about uh, what some of the most important ways uh, that you think gender has been at work uh, in, in this campaign season. Well, that's a really tricky, you open it up with the trickiest question, <laughs> right. because, you know, this is a subject about which I think many of us, including me, um, people who think about it all the time and people who rarely think about it, both long for and hope for easy, direct answers, um, you know, that we can say, this is this happened to Hillary, or this is how people react to Hillary, or this is what Hillary said, and it's because she's a woman, or conversely, the hope for many more people, this has nothing to do with her being a woman. You know, we hope for these easy connections and, and explanations that are clear and direct. And when it comes to, to gender, um, and I think this is also true when it comes to race and ethnicity and identity in this country, when it comes to gender, it's very rarely that clear cut. And that easy. It's very hard to find instances. And there were more of them in 2008 where, you know, somebody would say, oh, when you hear her voice, um, when men hear her voice, they think of 
you know, their, their wife yelling, take out the trash. Or when you see Hillary Clinton, you think of everyone's ex-wife standing outside of probate court. Those were actual things that people said on cable TV networks about Hillary Clinton in 2008. And while I'm sure there've been comments of that quality this time, they've been far rarer. Um, and it, the, the heart of the issue and the complexity and what makes it hard to talk about is that, you know, the basic fact that we, we too often forget is we've never had a woman, not only have we never had a woman president in the United States, we've never had a woman vice president. We have never had a major party nominate a woman for the presidency. And only two women have ever been nominated for the vice presidency. So that is startlingly undemocratic, unrepresentative, un-American. It is, it is a, a, the inverse of how our rep representative government is supposed to work for a country that is 51% female. So if you're talking about Hillary Clinton, the first woman to be nominated by a major party for the presidency, a woman who has operated within this really wholly male sphere, if you're talking about presidential politics, um, and, and more broadly, if you're talking about politics, still massively male, massively white sphere. Um, Hillary Clinton has operated within this sphere as an anomaly for her entire career. It is almost impossible to talk about Hillary Clinton without gender coming into play in one way or another. So even if it's not as easy as that was sexist or she's, she's doing well because she's a woman or some of these easy equations that we'd so love to be able to just get our hands on and be able to really understand, um, that's so rarely the case that it's that easy, but it's also the case that it's impossible to separate who Hillary Clinton is, how she strategizes her campaign, and how people react to her without it being, in some degree, shaped by the fact that she's a woman. Is that a very unsatisfying answer? But isn't that the case that in all social interactions, we have a lot of expectations about one another when we meet one another? And so, for instance, uh, were she to appear in some event in Iowa or in Texas or in California, she's got to reach out to people and half of those people are men, half of those people are women. 100% of those, those people have a lifetime of expectations. So there's a certain way in which it's unavoidable to have some kind of expectations. And so how does that, like how does one separate that from, uh, let's say, pejorative expectations versus the fact that we all grew up or, you know, nearly all people have grown up as men or women? Well, I mean, I, that, that gets to the heart of, I think, part of what I'm saying, which is that we all have our expectations about how, um, you know, how men and women talk. So let's, let's, for example, let's talk about her voice, which has been one of the more obvious ways in which I think her gender has been received as different um, and as troublesome, right, this, this cycle. And, uh, you know, she's gotten a lot of criticism in many cases from people I respect and who I think are, like, good, strong feminists and think carefully about gender. She gets a lot of criticism for the tone of her voice because when she gives a big speech, she's not a natural uh, big speech giver. <laughs> um, we can talk a lot about the fact that she is not regarded as somebody who has a lot of charisma or power to inspire on the stump. Um, and one of the things that gets talked about very, very often is the fact that she yells into a microphone, which she does. And it comes across as... Uh, grating or irritating. And it comes across that way to me, who is a feminist who writes, who's, I've really spent a decade writing about Hillary Clinton and how she is received with regard to gender. And I sit on my couch during some of those speeches in a little fetal position thinking, oh my God, please stop yelling into the microphone, just slower, softer, right? I'm guilty of this as well. But the fact is, if you compare her, especially to the two opponents she's had so far, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, who are two of the great yellers of the universe, we hear women's voices differently. Bernie Sanders could yell into a microphone about a revolution. We cannot fathom a female candidate and take, a, take away the aesthetics of, of Bernie's age and you know his hair and how he dressed. Take away the aesthetics. We could not conceive right now in this country of, of a woman who yelled into a microphone and demanded revolution and could become as popular as Bernie Sanders became with his, with his fans and voters. Some degree of that uh, has to do with, with tone and how we understand men to be communicating with us versus how we understand women to be communicating with us and what sends chills down our spine and what, and what inspires us to take to the streets and what we can identify with as righteous anger versus what we hear as pun a punishing tone. So that's just one area where we're bringing baggage 
the candidates themselves bring degrees of baggage to everything, you know, and, and of course there are lots of other examples like that, but that one has been, I think, chief and, are there any, and central. Yeah. I mean, are there any ways? And so the, when the historians of the 19th century had this, there was this period where there was all this really wonderful work on gender and politics before women had the vote. And right. one of the arguments that some historians, there was a historian, Paula Baker, for example, that they made was uh, before women could participate in party politics, many women found ways to use that negative, the negative stereotypes about uh, women and governance and, and turn it not to an advantage, but they found spaces uh, to participate politically. So uh, because women were uh, uncorrupted from party politics, they were able to be extremely influential in a lot of reforms or because there was this notion of the nurturing uh, mother, they use that to uh, get involved in welfare and civic activities that later became important. Is there anything like that with, with Hillary Clinton? Are there ways in which gender has worked uh, as a as a positive in getting her oh. to where she Yes, tremendously. There are a lot on many levels. Gender works as a positive as well as a negative, And that's something you have to take both together. So there are very basic upfront ways. Hillary has a lot of support. And we don't, you know, there, there's not a lot of coverage of the enthusiasm for her for a variety of reasons. The media is extremely attached to the idea that there's a lack of enthusiasm for Hillary. And of course, her negatives are very high during this election. But throughout her career, she's actually benefited tremendously for from having been a groundbreaking woman. Now, the same kind of groundbreaking woman who drew, who has drawn so much fire from the right, who's become a, a kind of lightning rod for controversy. She's also really played the role for now over over two decades in the in the national spotlight of a feminist hero for a lot of women. So there are lots of women who identify with her and, um, you know, her place having come out of this groundbreaking generation of women who in the late 20th century, you know, there was a move, especially of middle class white women into universities and workplaces that had previously been closed to them. Hillary Clinton becomes a symbol for that. A generation of women identify with that, regard her as a hero. She was the first first lady to have had a graduate degree and a career independent of her husband. Husbands, though, and this is one of the pieces of baggage that Hillary carries. She wasn't just, she wasn't unique in this. This is the reason she's important. She was a harbinger of what to come, what was to come. Both Laura Bush and Michelle Obama, of course, have had advanced degrees and separate careers, though Laura Bush's was, was less comparable to her husband's than Michelle Obama's was to Barack Obama's and Hillary Clinton's was to Bill Clinton's. But, um, you know, she, Hillary Clinton has stood for a wave of professional and economic and social and sexual gain for women that has, of course, exploded over the past few decades. And so she, while this makes her controversial, it also makes her a hero to many. She is having, there are lots of reports about the trouble she's having with young people, but she benefits a lot from a recent, a much more recent resurgence of feminist interest. There are a lot of young women who are, again, interested in participating in discourse around gender and power and, and a kind of newly repopularized feminism for whom Hillary Clinton is a new kind of hero, even if they don't remember her from when she was, a, you know, the, the early 90s lightning rod. It's also true that some of the issues that I think she's most progressive on are issues, it's interesting that you bring that up about the 19th century. You know, my, my last book included some thinking about the ways that women became involved in those, what became extremely disruptive social movements, abolition, suffrage, labor movement, temperance movement, the settlement house movement. And of course, as you said, in part, it was because I, I was thinking in that book, particularly about unmarried women whose adult lives were not given over to wifeliness and maternity in the way that previous generations had. And using a very feminized model for service and devotion to community, as opposed to service or devotion to self or prioritization of self, mm -hmm. a whole generation of women in the late 19th century and early 20th century in service to community got involved in what became these very radical acts that reshaped opportunity for so many groups of, of Americans. You know, Hillary Clinton as a even though she was an untraditional wife in that she was equivalently educated and by many measures uh, ta as talented and competent and smart as her husband, who would, was governor of Arkansas and then president, she also chose in the mid-70s to take on a, a traditionally wifely role in that she put her career second to her husband's. And the issues that I think genuinely interested her from law school on were issues that were comfortably feminized even within a legal sphere 
a professional and by many measures still radical, radical sphere for women to be involved with. She was writing about child welfare and she was when she was in law school and right after she wrote several well-regarded papers on laws regarding child welfare and child independence. She w- did rounds the Yale New Haven Hospital in the early days of thinking about child abuse as a legal issue. And she became involved in Arkansas in early childhood education programs. All of those things sort of fell squarely within the purview of what it was still feminized for women to think of. It was still okay for women to be involved in those things, right? They're traditional spheres. And they make up the heart of a lot of what is actually to my mind, thrillingly progressive about the policies that Hillary Clinton is putting forth because she is talking about a very robust program for paid family leave. Um, She's talking about early child care subsidies and early childhood interventions for families who need help and guidance. That stuff has been threaded here and there throughout her career from the time she was in law school. And I think that falls into the category of things that remain sort of until very recently, they've been considered very feminized areas of political interest and policy concern. But they're also extremely radical in that if we enacted them, which will be very hard to do, (laughs) um, we would radically alter the scope of possibility when it comes to gender and power and who can participate in workforces to what degree. And so I think that's an area where I think Uh, there's some echo of that 19th century pattern. Let's take that history that you've outlined about her and also of legislation and turn it forward to January. And I I have to say that I I sometimes feel a little bit detached from news cycles because uh, I look at what's probable and and I'm not so, you know, I get a little disappointed in a horse race. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, You've written in, uh, I think in all the single ladies, you've written about uh, the fraction of single women who are paid at minimum wage. And I just want to play out a scenario of what the most probable set of outcomes is. It's pretty likely that she's going to win and become the next president of the United States. It's, <laughs> I mean, it's very likely. I mean, like, I mean, there's no mincing words about it. I know that we're, I, I realize that journalists are supposed to pretend like there's suspense. No, but, I'm um, not pretending that there's suspense. I'm personally terrified. It's my own neurosis. Sure. It's not anything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the statistical definition of risk is probability multiplied by how big the outcome is. And and one could certainly argue that a Trump outcome is such a large outcome that even if the probability is 10%, that's like a really large outcome multiplied by 10%. Okay. So um, let's see. But what I was getting at is this. I'm, I just want to kind of get boring here and talk about legislative priorities. So let's say there's a Hillary Clinton presidency. Let's say that the House and Senate are closely divided and the Senate is Democratic. Not clear which way the House is going to be. So in this set of scenarios, what kinds of legislative priorities could she and uh, either Speaker Pelosi or Speaker Ryan risk on? Is minimum wage increase oh. the thing that could could get to people? What's your read? You've followed her around so much. Yeah, I think my read would be. I mean, if she had a if she had a cooperative Congress, I would be willing to bet money that actually paid family leave and perhaps some early childhood um, subsidy, probably reduced in form from what some of us on the left might imagine or hope for would probably be a, an early priority for her. And if she had a cooperative Congress, I mean, when you begin to say Speaker Pelosi. Um, no, that was just, I mean, that's like, right. more like Speaker Ryan, but I'll, let's just say, okay, let's just take a simple case because it's the one that's probably going to look best four months from now. Right. Um, Democratic Senate, Republican House, President right. Clinton. Right. Well, I think that I actually think that one of her better gambits would be the early childhood stuff, because that is early education, pre-kindergarten and um, zero to three stuff is some policy that's actually begun to take root in some conservative states. It's one of the few areas of real progressive policy where you can see at least the hint of some conservative willingness to move. So that would probably be the thing I felt most optimistic about. I got to tell you that if, if we're looking at a Democratic Senate and a Republican House and a President Clinton, I'm not particularly optimistic about moving a lot of this policy forward. The one thing I'm optimistic about, and it's a big thing, is the court. So, which is, you know, but legislatively, again, I'd say that the best gambit might be early childhood stuff. Maybe I'm wrong in my read on raising the minimum wage, but I cannot imagine that getting through the House. You know, I'm just immigration reform. You know, this, this set of things... Um, the one thing about Hillary Clinton is she, one thing she's very good at is 
thinking about every possible lever and button and switch and compromise. It's one of the things that makes her to the left because she is willing to compromise and um, reduce the scope of what she wants in order to get it through. And I know that she's, I, I know from my interviews with her that she has been thinking about all these scenarios in great detail for months now. And so, you know, she may have ideas about how to move some of, I suspect she does because she is fundamentally a doer. I mean, she is fundamentally somebody who wants to make the wheels turn, even if they're turning only slightly. And so it's possible that she has some creative solution that will probably, you know, dissatisfy everyone involved to move something in terms of minimum wage or in terms of immigration or in terms of paid leave. Maybe paid leave is becoming a paid family leave, which really would be a, a radical piece of of legislation if we were able to mandate it federally. I mean, it's very interesting that Donald Trump, the Republican candidate, has crossed just about every party line to, to propose his own version this week of paid leave, which is uh, anemic and, and not good. Um, you know, so, so maybe there is there could be enough movement on the right to get some version of one of those things done. But I think legislatively, unless she has the House, which we know is very unlikely, we're not going to see much movement in the first two years. I'd put it unlikely, not very unlikely, but unlikely. Oh, well, that's good. I'm glad so, you're more optimistic than I am. I, you know, it's good. Okay. So, so let's see. So now what about, um, let's, but let's, speaking of t down ticket, um, there's a story that seems to have not been covered. And I'm wondering, uh, you may have thoughts on this. Uh, if you look at five of the close Senate races right now, it's notable that the Democratic candidates in these five races are all women. Mm. Anne Kirkpatrick, Catherine Cortez Masto, Deborah Ross, Maggie Hassan, and Katie McGinty. These are the five, actually, it was a quite a coincidence when I ran across it, five closest races. Uh, these races will certainly determine control of the Senate. Mm -hmm. But I haven't, have you noticed much con coverage of this? And, and do you think it's a good or a bad thing that that year of the woman hype has not somehow encompassed these five candidates? Well, you know, I'm going to, talk here about my theory about part of why this is, and I, and I want to stress that this is not something that I myself have gone out and reported exactly, but part of what you are looking at is a series of candidates. The, the various women who, in electoral politics, are very, many of them are very savvy, and certainly the organizations from which they get funding and, and direction are very savvy about gender politics. And it's not an accident that we see so many women, so many Democratic women running this year. There was a sense a long time ago that we were going to have a woman at the top of the ticket. And you see, you're seeing oh, a lot of women in the race. I mean, there is no question in my mind. Again, I'm speaking here about my own armchair theory. This is not something I have, you know, cemented as, as a reporter should I'm speaking as an opinion columnist who's, who's imagining things, but I think it's, I think it's right. I think there's, you know, we saw Barbara Boxer and Barbara Mikulski retire for this cycle. And I think that's not an accident. I think both of them imagined it's very, you don't want to give up a seat. You don't want to give up one of the very few Senate seats that belongs to a women. And both Mikulski and Boxer have held those seats for a long time. And I think it was no accident that they chose to retire so that their elections would take place during this cycle. Now, of course, in Mikulski's case, because Donna Edwards was beaten by a man, there's not the hope that there's going to be a Democratic woman who replaces her. But I think that you probably are looking at the results of similar strategizing, thinking that if there is a break in the women's vote, and, and how women vote is is complicated, obviously. They, they don't vote as, as a sort of giant ovarian block, right? But um, it's divided in terms of, of where their allegiance is. But if there was a thought amongst women with ambitions for the Senate, when am I going to do, when, when am I going to take my chance? This is as good a year as any, if you could imagine that there was going to be a woman at the top of the ticket that might draw out voters who were interested in voting for women up and down the ticket. Are they talking so, about it? Are they are they talking are the are the candidates talking about it? Yeah, I want to know if Katie oh, yeah. McGinty is tying herself to Hillary. I want to know if Deborah Ross is tying herself to Hillary like that. I haven't reported on them all individually, um, but yes, we, yes, they're talking about it, and yes, the organizations that are behind them. I mean, Emily's List is a huge force for these women, and they're all talking. You know, any event you go to where you hear I, I, a lot of women running for seats up and down tickets. It's not good to c talk constantly <laughs> about the fact that you're a right. woman, right. but certainly the women who I've seen on the, on the trail or been listening to or reading about are speaking 
admiringly about Hillary Clinton, there's, there's, I see quite a bit of unity amongst Democrats this year. Um, you can see it obviously with the unprecedented relationship, not, not a recently unprecedented relationship between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. I mean, you, you don't often see a president who both wants to be out there on behalf of his potential successor and who the successor wants, d- desperately wants to have out there on her behalf. So I, I am seeing generally, uh, quite a bit of unity, and certainly for those women who are running for the Senate. I, I also want to point out one really important thing about the women who are running for the Senate. So you, you have um, Kamala Harris in California, uh, Tammy Duckworth, Cortez Masto. One of the remarkable things, also undemocratic, un, un-American, unrepresentative, is that historically, we've only had one African-American woman in the Senate ever, Carol Mosley Brown from Illinois who was elected in that year of the woman. And we've only ever had two women of color, Mosley Brown and Maisie Hirono from Hawaii, who's there now. So if Kamala Harris is elected, she would double the number of black women who've served in the American Senate in our history. And Tammy Duckworth and, and Cortez Masto, uh, I mean, there, we could see a, just a huge change based in part on the fact that our historical numbers of women of color in the Senate are so meager. We could see a doubling of those numbers. And I think that's important and something that hasn't been covered enough. I'm going to reveal something to our listeners as to how I get my news. I just learned from you that Tammy Duckworth is not white. And uh, that just tells you how in a closet I live with my numbers. Anyway, go on. Wait, you've just made me need to Google to make sure I'm not getting the Tammy's confused. No, no, no. I said right. I mean, <laughs> right. right. Tammy Baldwin and Tammy Duckworth and every once in a while, in a, especially yeah. when I haven't slept very much. I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I don't, no, I'm, it I'm is just, correct. I'm Tammy Duckworth. Yeah. Could I, I mean, this discussion, I, I was, my premise might be wrong here, but um, you're outlining all these very historic things about this moment in politics with the first female nominee of a major party who is pushing for a very progressive agenda on these issues of gender. And you've written about all these changes in the electorate with single women. All of this is going on right now. And, and you know, I imagine if I've looked, when you look back at the early 1960s and the 64 election, it's a battle over race and Mm -hmm. race relations is front and center. And at least historically, we're cognizant that that was the issue of the moment. And I think at the time they were. And I don't know, there's a a, I'm not convinced that right now people think of the election that way. And I don't understand exactly. Is it the issue? Is it Hillary Clinton? Um, or is it, do you think that we don't see these things sometimes as they're happening? Well, first of all, I think that this is also an election about race, very much so. And that, that to some degree, is more prominent in how we talk about it. But, and I think that has to do with just differences in terms of how we talk about race and gender that are very longstanding and very complicated and that I certainly can't fully explain <laughs> um, in the span of a podcast or probably even in the span of, of a full book. But I think part of what we're seeing right now is a real, a national realignment that that in many ways is as dramatic as, or you know, I, I guess I shouldn't make the comparisons historically, but is, we have, we are living through a period of tremendous flux, and that's true on many levels. It's true when it comes to our representational politics. It's true when it comes to policies that we're looking at enacting. The movement of I think I believe the electorate to the left and left of where it's been in a long time. You know, it's happening in the entertainment world with the emergence of different kinds of artists who, um, you know, it, it, we are moving away from a historical model of exclusively white male dominance. And of course, we've moved away from that at various stages throughout our history in various different fits and starts. And then we move backward and then we move forward. It's all very circular and it's not a clear path. But we're in a movement of tremendous flux around these issues, around race, gender, identity, and power. Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama happen to be symbols, these individual, insufficient, deeply imperfect symbols for some of that flux. They are unprecedented in presidential history. My first book was about how in many ways they repeated very old history by being pitted against each other. You know, when a seat opens at the table, these representatives of two populations who should be working together wind up being pitted against each other. And that's just one of the ways in which white male power is reinforced. You set the, you know, you set the challengers to it against each other to take each other down. And that was what was happening in 2008. It really struck me during the Democratic convention, the night that Obama gave his speech and that Hillary Clinton came out on stage afterwards and they embraced and that picture was, was everywhere, that part of what is really so threatening and so jarring to this country 
is when they're working together in collaboration, which they very much are. And I think that what we're experiencing right now with the candidacy of Donald Trump and the, the intense biases, anger, and hatred that animate some proportion of his supporters and certainly animate so much of his own speech and rhetoric and, and policy ideas, what you're seeing is a, is a deep spasm of reaction and resistance to the kinds of progress that those two figures represent, especially when they're working in tandem. Can we talk and, about that proportion a little bit? I, I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can talk yeah. about it. And I've been trying to do a calculation just in my own, again, nerdy way of just how many Trump supporters are in this basket of deplorables. And mm -hmm. it turns out that one hits a wall that has to do with this race gender divide. I've had no trouble finding survey questions that look for bias against blacks. Do you wish the South had won the Civil War? What do you think of the Emancipation Proclamation? What do you think about homosexuals being banned from entering the US? Was Judge Curiel biased simply because of ethnicity? Deporting Muslims. There's no shortage of bias questions and uh, you know about all these other groups. But I've actually had trouble finding survey evidence about bias against women. And I'm wondering, where are these questions? Do we even have agreement about what would be a good question that we could all agree would be a question that spoke to that? We don't. We don't have agreement. We have a very hard time in this country talking about gender. Now, that's not to say that talking about race is easier. It's just a different process. Um, and the reasons why we have a, a much more difficult time giving sort of shape and description or coming to an agreement on what, what constitutes sexism. I mean, there are a million different theories about it. I think most persuasive to me is that women are half the population. So women are much more threaded into everyone's lives than in sure, a way that makes it harder and more personalized. Yeah, lots of people have there. never met, lots of people have never met a Muslim. Right, exactly. Everyone's every, met a woman. Everyone's met a woman and everyone has their own deeply, and in fact, Many of us have mothers. Um, I mean, <laughs> the, yes. right. Well, you know, not everybody, but but many of us. I mean, and, and so so our very earliest relationships in in the vast majority of cases are with women, and it and I think it becomes an. And I don't want to say harder or easier. A very different process to organize our brains and separate our personal relationships and bonds and feelings about women from our ideology about how they should be treated, our experiences of being married to them or loving them or them being our daughters or our mothers versus how we think we should treat them in terms of public policy. This stuff gets jumbled in a way that I think makes it just a Again, I, I don't want to, it's not, it's not a quality thing. It's not e easier or harder. It's, it's just a very different kind of conversation than the kind of conversation that can take place, again, with enormous difficulty um, around racial difference, where, where the percentages are different and, and many people's experiences are different. So, but whatever it is, and there are probably 40 people who would have 40 different ideas about why we talk about gender so differently. But the reality is we do. And we have a very hard time feeling good about women's progress. You know, if you think about, for example, the women's movement of the, of the 1970s, mm -hmm. there's very little warm nostalgia about that movement. Right. There is the civil right. rights movement. Right. There right. is civil a warm, a distorted nostalgia about the civil rights movement, right? The dishonest yeah. sort of flattening out of all its complexities and tensions and nuance into a, you know, a Hallmark card of Dr. King. There is, I, again, like I don't want to claim that one way is better than the other, <laughs> but, but this country, even if it's a matter of a kind of deeply false patting ourselves on the back <laughs> in terms of progress on civil rights, a deeply dishonest sense that, oh, we've come so far, we actually, we sort of have that self-satisfaction about women, like, no, don't worry, we fixed it all, without any of the warmth or the rose-colored glasses, about the women's movement of the 1970s. You know, uh, that's just one example. I mean, a, another example, a very concrete one from my book in 2008 that I was just stunned by, and I was stunned again as a reporter who was writing about gender and politics as this was happening. In 2008, um, the very beginning of the primary cycle, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, you know, Iowa, she loses, she comes in third to Obama and to John Edwards. There's all of this crazy anticipation in the five days between Iowa and New Hampshire that she's going to lose in New Hampshire where she's predicted to lose. All the polls suggest she's going to lose. 
And um, then she's going to be out of the race. And the, you know, the woman who was supposed to be the Bigfoot was, is going to be out by Super Tuesday and all this stuff. And that's when she gets congested and she has her days in New Hampshire and she gets congested. And, she, and in this surprise win, she winds up winning the New Hampshire primary. And it is covered, you know, all the stuff that she cried. Is this why she won? It's, it, it, she wins it because women come out and vote in huge numbers for her. And she beats Barack Obama. And there's tons of coverage. She cried. Is this what made it happen for her? Women love tears. There's a sort of soggy sisterhood. What, what could have happened? What could have happened? And what does not get reported, and I am talking about like reports in the New York Times on CNN the day after this primary, is that it is the first primary in America's history, first presidential primary that has been won by a woman. There was a primary in 1972 that Shirley Chisholm won, but it was non-binding and her biggest competitors were not on the ballot. So there is an asterisk about 1972 and Shirley Chisholm. But aside from that, it is the first presidential primary ever won by a woman in the United States. And that was not in the New York Times story the day after she won. And in fact, I will tell you that I only learned this is a terribly embarrassing fact. I reported on Hillary Clinton and gender through that whole, through 2008. And when I was writing my book, it must have been a year later, I was, I was interviewing Ellen Malcolm, the founder of Emily's List. And she told me a story of that night in New Hampshire. And she told me the story of the surprise win. Hillary's elated. She's going up on stage to make her acceptance speech in New Hampshire. And she grabs Ellen Malcolm's hand and says, and whispers to her, I'm the first woman, woman to win a primary. Hillary Clinton knew it. And the New York Times didn't report on it. And so, I mean, that's just a one very concrete, and to my mind, still, I get, I get sad when I think about that still. Um, example, it's a compliment. She was such a major figure that people didn't think of it. Well, it's a compliment. But, you know, I mean, she's such a major figure, but it's also we lose something really important about both our history and where we are now when we are not able to acknowledge what's new and what's never happened before. I think it also stems from a real dishonesty about where we've been in the past. And that is certainly true with regard to race, with regard to gender, all kinds of things. We don't like to take long, hard looks at ourselves <laughs> in the United States. And, um, and there's a long history of, you know, progressive movements, progressive on everything. Uh, but when it comes to issues of gender, you know, straight through the 60s and 70s, they, they fell very short. And so even in those er pockets of politics where you think this would be an area of discussion, the history suggests, you know, this bias runs really deep. Part of the answer of why, why the New York Times and reporters in the Times might not have been paying attention to what mattered. Right. Well, and of course, you know, what, what you're getting at is that all these, you know, sexism, for lack of a better word, within left circles, right, within progressive circles, just like certainly racism within feminist circles and homophobia within feminist circles. I mean, you know, the, what we lump together as sort of progressive movements have often been um, the places where uh, explosive movements, you know, burst from because there's there's inequity within those, you know, so sexism within the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement, the student movement of the, of the 1960s was part of what produced the women's movement of the 1970s. Um, and of course, the the degree homophobia within the women's movement and Betty Friedan talking about the lavender menace, um, you know, precedes the, the gay rights movement. So I also wonder sometimes, and I keep thinking about it as I watch the coverage, the sort of mainstream coverage this year, I sometimes wonder the degree to which our press really cares about this stuff. <laughs> I mean, historians care, activists care, people who care, you know, I sometimes, and as somebody who's a member of the press and whose job it is to care and who naturally cares about, about all this, I, I've just been so perplexed. I thought this year that there would be tons of coverage. In 2008, Hillary Clinton was the, was the losing candidate. And I was covering her and I was, you know, there were other people who were doing it too, but you know, I, w I was covering her consistently, still didn't know she was the first woman to win a primary in New Hampshire, but I was covering her consistently. But this time, I was sure that the newspapers would be drowning in thoughtful commentary about gender, power, history. And that's not happening. They seem more interested in um, phlegm Gazi. 
Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, we're we're actually out of time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to uh, bring this to an end. But but uh, on that note, um, and and hopefully uh, with positive breakthroughs ahead, though, mm. uh, I want to thank Rebecca Traster uh, for joining us today. Again, her most recent book is All the Single Ladies, Unmarried Women, and the Rise of an Independent Nation by Simon and Schuster. Published it. It's available everywhere: Amazon.com, Barnes and Nobles, book stores everywhere and it's really a it's a powerful book for this election season so i hope i hope people can get it thanks for joining us thanks so much for having me and we'll be back soon on politics and polls have a good week bye everybody you've been listening to politics and polls a podcast series about the 2016 presidential election produced by WooCast. the content discussed in this podcast is intended to be informational only It does not represent nor reflect the views of Princeton University or the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs.